Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Erin O'Toole, and I'm the Baker Street Foundation Associate Curator of Photography at SFMOMA. And it's my great pleasure to be here today with Catherine Wagner, uh, artist and um, chair of the photography department at Mills College. Um, we're going to do a little um, sit and stand act because we, uh, Catherine has a bad back and I have bad feet, so I need to sit and she needs to stand. <laughs> so it may look a little weird, but you'll, we'll, we'll all get used to it as we as we go. Um, so. Catherine and I have um, known each other for a number of years, but we've never had a chance to um, do anything together formally. So I'm glad that, that finally we're getting this opportunity to, to, to do something um, in front of uh, this nice crowd of friendly faces. And um, rather than uh, start with a, a, a red introduction, I thought we would just launch right into questions and, and sort of get to background information by way of the, of the questions. Um, um, so, uh, most people know you as a photographer, and so, um, but today we're going to talk about uh, projects that you've done that um, reach beyond photography, um, and in, in, in some, photography is just one component in many, and then some, it's hard to sort of see where the photography is even at all, um, and so as the title for this uh, talk suggests over time you've developed what you term an expanded practice. And so I wanted to, to ask you to start by explaining to us what you mean when you say an expanded practice. Okay, so can somebody turn down the din outside? Uh, so I often refer to uh, my practice, um, which always begins with some kind of an image and some kind of a photographic image. Uh, and often that's, that's where it stays and that's the way it, it's, it's meant to be. But for so long I've had an interest in, in using architecture um, as a metaphor for, for contemporary culture that maybe 20 years ago I started thinking about what happens if I, if I try to seamlessly integrate photographs into architectural environments. And so in doing that, um, it led me to thinking about more three-dimensional ways of, of making photographs, um, different substrates and materials that I might work on photographically that lends itself to a much more architectural environment, um, whether it's outside or in notions of permanence. So, I, and it, it, wasn't, it had nothing to do with thinking about the limitations of photography because I don't think there are limitations of photography, certainly not philosophically or conceptually, but it was more of a desire to see how can these photographs exist in other spaces, both two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally, and integrate into architecture. Did you have any models for doing this? Anybody that you had seen do it uh, um, well beforehand? Or was this something that, that just sort of came organically out of what your interests were? I'm really interested in materials. And so I was always in traveling. It's like the three things that my partner and I do is like look at architecture, both historical and contemporary. Um, look at museums, both historical and contemporary, and the artwork obviously within. Um, uh, the food markets uh, and restaurants, uh, but so I'm always looking at I'm always looking at the way that materials are handled, and I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about kind of other modalities of how that might work. So there wasn't an art a singular artist per se, but I, kind of in looking at a lot of kind of like sculptural work, it, it, it became it became kind of a catalyst for me to think about. What happens if I was to integrate photography into that? Mm -hmm. Great. Well, maybe we could start looking at um, the first uh, project here. Um, and um, so this, this project, um, which was photographs that you made at the, during the construction of the Moscone Convention Center at South of Market in the late 70s and 1980s. Um, but, but I wanted to, to ask you, before we started talking about this, um, 
if you could give us a little background on your um, y how you came to be making these photographs um, in the 70s, south of market. You know, what, what was your journey to get to this point? Just so we know a little bit about your background as a photographer and that what led you to be taking pictures of a construction site with a large format camera. So um, prior to this work, I was looking at the urban landscape and having grown up on the West Coast, kind of the dominant, um, the dominant thinking about landscape was m very much revolving around um, more of the school of the West Coast Landscape School around Ansel Adams, Wynn Bullock, um, that group of work. But for me, as somebody who was in my you know, very early 20s, I was really interested in the changing landscape and the ways in which that cities or communities were being formed. So I was looking at um, these kind of like silent demarcations about where a city begins and ends. And those were the kinds of catalysts. So when I came across the, um, the Moscone site and knew that this would be a construction site for the next seven years, I, I wrote a letter to the city of San Francisco um, and or to the um, to actually to the contractors who were in charge of it and I wrote this letter like as an art student saying something like I'm interested in these ideas of archaeology in reverse you can imagine how this went over with the head of a, con a contracting company <laughs> I'm interested in these ideas of archaeology in reverse I'm interested in the notion of future ruins anyhow the gentleman called me up and he said ma'am I have no idea what you're talking about um, <laughs> But um, why don't you come down here and we'll give you a, um, an orange hat and a vest and we'll see what we can do for you. So long story short, um, I had basically the key to the Moscone site for about five and a half years. And I would go in every weekend that I was in town and make photographs there. And I, in, in many ways, it was kind of like my arena of this place. But there was so much going on socially and politically in that in order to make this construction site, which um, this building, which was you know, going to define the way that San Francisco has so radically changed, it, has, it is now the cultural center of San Francisco, they, they did these heinous things like kind of like move, move the homeless population up four blocks uh, and nothing's changed since then. So my interest really was in, in this notion of um, a site that talks about ideas of change and that I was interested as an artist in thinking about notions of change as a common denominator to all our lives. So that's what brought me to this. So you mentioned that you were um, interested in sculpture and, and in a lot of these pictures you, um, you, you see forms that are almost like found sculpture. Were you, were you seeing it that way? I mean, in many ways I used to call the site like ephemeral sculpture because there was a, the site was a building of 36 columnless arches, which unto itself was really an engineering feat at that time. And there was something I thought very poetic about these these two places um, where an arch is built, it, it, begins, it begins on one point of the landscape and it, 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 it reaches forward, it reaches across to connect these two, two points in the land. So I was very, um, I was excited by the kinds of ideas that um, construction um, was presenting itself on a, on a very kind of conceptual level. Well, and it's, it's very theatrical, too, you know, that it's all presented out here on this sort of stage. Um, and then each day, you know, you're, you're sort of experiencing a new play or what, what have you. And, and, and it's constantly changing. So, you know, you photographed it this day from this angle, but it would have looked different the next day. Oh, so. and in fact, you know, weekly it changed. And mm -hmm. so what was interesting was that I was like concentrating, kind of like circumnavigating that, the parameter of this site. Um, going down into it, actually being on top of the rebar, and it was always in a state of flux, which I thought that was actually part of the, the philosophical ideas that I was um, talking about. Mm -hmm. So that um, we can get to. And so what's fascinating is that, that um, you know, you were talking about Moscone even then, um, before it was built as future ruins, right. and then yeah. and then now that's actually come true in a very short period of time because that version of Moscone has 
been torn down right. only recently and then been rebuilt. And then now you're um, reusing those photographs of the, of the now um, you know, torn down site for this new purpose, which is really interesting. So you anticipated that they would be future ruins. You probably <laughs> didn't think it would happen yeah. you know, within your lifetime. Not in my lifetime, that's right. <laughs> um, but so, so maybe you could explain how they are so having this new life. About, I think it was about 10 years ago, um, there was a federal stimulus program by President Obama, and which gave the money to the city of San Francisco to build the first subway station that would go north-south, meaning from like Caltrain to in front of SFMOMA, the Moscone site, to Union Square, and then to Chinatown. And so San Francisco has been basically torn up for the last 10 years because of this. And so it's, um, the, the people of San Francisco are not at all pleased with, um, with, the, with what's going on there. With that said, they asked, um, uh, they asked me if I would you know, like to participate in the subway in front, at the Moscone site in front of SFMOMA. And they're kind of dubbing that, it's being called Museum Station. And I thought, oh, this is kind of amazing in that, you know, when I was 21 years old, I made these photographs of this construction site, and now I'm going to take those same photographs, and then I developed this process with um, a young man um, who's been working in, in stone for many years, and he and I had worked on a previous project in, um, in metal, and we set about trying to make these same photographs, which are very intricate in terms of like, there's a lot of line work and a lot of gradations, et cetera. And those are now installed um, uh, at, at Fourth and, and Folsom. And they're on like 15 foot granite panels so that you can see um, when you come up from the, um, when you come up from the uh, subway, when it ever opens, um, you would come up and you would see the sequence of, of how these kind of columns, those arches were being formed, but they're, they're still photographs, they feel incredibly photographic, but they're on this other substrate, which is granite. And it is um, kind of uncanny that this is happening in my lifetime, yes. Well, and also, I think it's fascinating that what you're making to sort of um, memorialize these future ruins is photographs on stone. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it's, you know, sort of solving the, the issue that, um, you know, photographers always face when it comes to this kind of public art, which is that photographs are, um, you know, e ephemeral. They don't last forever. And when they're exposed to the elements and to light, they fade and they change. And so um, often Often photographers are not the, the artists who, who get these kinds of commissions because the work isn't going to last in that kind of, a, in that kind of an environment. Um, and so you've sort of solved the problem of, of, of that, but then it's also, um, to me, really interesting that, that now they are, um, you know, these permanent photographs. Um, right. They're essentially sort of etchings though, right? Is that? They're, they're, they're laser etched onto granite. They're laser etched onto granite. But you saw um, at the studio the other day. I mean, they are so highly photographic that it's, it's kind of mesmerizing. Yeah. Well, and, and this is something, you know, that you'll see over the course of the, the next couple of projects of, of Catherine's that we, we look at is that um, she works very hard with, um, with other um, people, collaborates with other people to um, figure out how to fabricate something that will work for the, for the site. And so that this was a, a long time process to, co to come up with something that, that met your standards and that was going to work in this, um, in, this, in this situation. Can you talk a little little bit about like what that's like you know that collaboration so you know we've all seen like etchings on gravestones but we wanted to bring this to a whole other level and I'm, I'm somebody who actually really enjoys the process of like making making prints beautiful there's something I think that is very commanding that whether or not you understand the content um, beauty becomes a strategy to look at something so this is actually in the workshop up up uh, in Northern California where I've been working with the stonemason. And basically a member of my team taught the stonemason how to think about Photoshop and curves and, and shadows and highlights. And so we kind of tackled this in the same way that you would think about kind of an analog process of being in the dark room. 
And this is just um, laying, out the, uh, laying out the tiles. So sometimes we would run these granite slabs through the laser press like three times. And so if you know anything about the print process, that's similar to like making a tritone or, you know, a duotone. Yeah. So this is just, um, this is one that's been finished and you can kind of get a sense of like the scale of it and, and the quality of being able to work with those materials. Yeah. I think it's gonna, people are gonna be very excited when, when, when we finally see it, since nobody knows when the, when the subway is actually gonna open. So this is actually, um, we're not allowed to take pictures down at the, in the subway right now, but we've smuggled one out on the iPhone. Um, and this is actually during the process where they were installing them. The whole piece is completely installed. Um, so this is, uh, this is a little iPhone snapshot of one of the pieces during construction being installed at at on, on site. So you're just looking at these kind of construction lights, et cetera, that are there, but the actual um, uh, material and, and kind of the beauty of it is really um, transcendent, I think. And then on the, on the, um, on the um, not below ground, but on the, um, where you enter the station, there'll be like a 50 foot piece of glass with that signature image and so that's a laser etched piece of glass and it's supposed to kind of be evocative. It's, it's very done in a, a ceramic frit and so it's very kind of milky white and so it's supposed to elicit a kind of ghostliness of like what was once there. Um, so just as a, a way into to this um, next project, um, so we, we, we went sort of, we started in time and then we've kind of jumped uh, jumped forward and now we're going back in time a little bit. Um, so personally, and I think this is sort of a, um, a nerdy curator kind of thing, but um, I, I love seeing the same exhibition in many different venues because it's really fascinating to see how um, the changes in the installation or the design or even just simply the architecture of the space changes how the meaning, how we experience the, sh the show, what, what the meaning of the pieces is, how we understand it. Um, and it seems to me that um, you were very attuned to this idea early in your career um, and, and that with this um, body of work, um, Home and Other Stories, um, you, you started to experiment with exhibition design and with the presentation of your work in different spaces, sort of responding to the spaces. Um, so this is very different from what we just talked about. This is really about um, the experience of an exhibition um, in, a, in a gallery space. And so how did, you, how did this come about? How, how how, give us the, the background. So the body of work was called Home and Other Stories and it was a, a body of work I did that I was looking at um, the places that we call home and all the ways in which we define who we are through the way we decorate, through the furniture, through photographs that we look at, and all the ways in which kind of domesticity talks about family, alienation, isolation, love, and I was just intrigued by kind of like the iconic symbols, if you will, that, that we project to define ourselves through our homes. So in, in doing that, um, when the curator asked me at, at, at LACMA you know, to do this show, I said, well, I really don't want to do a show where I'm just going to be kind of putting these postage stamps on the wall. And they were, um, they were these six foot sentence like um, triptychs. And I say they were sentence like because three images were the minimum amount of Im images I could use that would form some kind of like, some kind of sentence structure. And the name of the project was called Home and Other Stories. And I was really interested in the ways in which people would look at these photographs. I, I never knew the people whose homes they were. It was always like a friend of a friend of a friend or the security guard at the museum and their next door neighbor. And it allowed me to um, embrace my own kind of like storyteller um, point of view. So when I started thinking about kind of thinking about that language based um, element to, to looking at the work, I thought when you read a book and you're at home and you read a book, there's an intimacy to holding that book and having that cadence of reading and time. So I, I decided at that time that I would hand cut all the um, the lights, um, this tape that kind of blocks out all the light, and 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 have them frame the um, the actual triptychs so that when you walked in the gallery, they 
they were either misconstrued as, um, as light boxes or television sets. And it, it allowed people to, um, in a very intimate way, kind of stand up next to those, those triptychs. And I used to, at the opening, I heard people say, oh, well, this must be like um, a flight attendant who lives alone and there's nothing in her refrigerator. And you know, it was people kind of like projecting their own stories. And I, and I kind of wanted to move away from that notion of like the white wall. So I started, I chose a color that I was very interested in and I just worked with that gradient of that color throughout the museum. So it, was, it started with kind of like a dense green and then it kind of moved through these different gradients. So it was, it was an experiment really to, um, to, to not, not to work with materials, but to like work with an exhibition and, and allow myself to see those photographs in a, in a very non-traditional way. So when you were making the photographs, did you realize that you were gonna show more than one together or was that something that sort of developed over the course of, of I, I started the first in video with, with making these in video and, and there was so much footage I got lost so I went back to using the still camera and it was like the minimal amount of photographs I could use that would create that kind of no, mini novella would be three. Mm -hmm. So I knew they were going to be triptychs, but I had no idea what I might try to engage in until I saw the site of the museum. Um, and, and so you, you rarely um, in your work photograph human figures, but most of your work is really about people, about humanity, um, what people make, where they live, how they order the world. Um, um, and this project is a great example where it's all about people, but the people are, are not in the pictures. And so I'm wondering, you know, why did you choose not to photograph the residents them, themselves, uh, you know, amidst their belongings? So what did, you, what did you feel like this afforded you by not photographing the people? Well, um, I think, like you said, there's, there's rarely a person in my photographs. Um, in the Moscone ones, you'll see some very miniature construction workers. Um, but I, in many ways, when people ask me, like, why don't you photograph people, it, I, it always takes me back because I feel that the photographs are, are very much portraits without faces. And they're portraits of not just the specificity of one person, but they're much more of a cultural portrait about who we are as a culture. And that I think in many ways I tackle, you know, a, a seemingly um, array or a disparate array of different kinds of topics, but they're all engaged in, in what I call like the construction of culture. Like what makes up who we are as a culture? What are, what are our individual and, and collective aspirations? Who are we? Who will we become? So I felt that by, in the same way I've worked with American Classroom and, and, and talked about those uh, spaces, I felt that choosing kind of like iconic, um, sometimes very banal, in, in most cases, very banal kinds of objects to form these um, triptychs, if you will, spoke, spoke to a more nuanced and a quieter version of, of a, a, a portrait. Well, and also it leaves it leaves it open, like you said, for the the viewer to you know sort of create the story, to imagine who the who the residents might be by looking at their um, their belongings, um, and so they can sort of piece something together. And so maybe by leaving that open, you're you're giving you're giving them more agency in the um, in the act of viewing too. Yeah. Um, so it's not as as closed off. Yeah. Um, and I think that's important because. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to document. I'm not trying to document somebody's home or a family. I'm really trying to keep that much more open-ended. I thought it would be important to actually show you because the screen is odd. You can't really see the work. So I'll just show you what some of the triptychs look like. So this was panel A, or one, two, three. So that's, that's what comprised the triptych. Or in this, and that's how the triptych looks. Or in this one, um, this was a, psychiatrist's house in, in uh, Los Angeles. And when I first walked in their home, I thought, oh my God, they've got 12 children. <laughs> um, and then of course, on closer inspection, one realizes, no, it's this homage to their, to their four children in this chronology. So like the second panel becomes um, more of a detail of that. And the third panel structurally very much looks like the second panel, but has completely different kinds of information. So there was no scientific way of making these. It was, I was really allowing a very subjective approach. Um, and so, as I was talking about seeing um, 
exhibitions installed in, in different venues. Then when you brought the show um, here to Mills after it, it was at LACMA, you sort of rethought the, the, um, the installation altogether. And so um, what was the inspiration for, for this version? So the, the, the LACMA show traveled and um, it went from, from LACMA to the Corcoran in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., I, 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 I installed them as if they were like a crossword puzzle. So all the triptychs were read vertically and then I might key off on the, another one that would connect to one of the images. Uh, there'd be a space. And so it read very much like a crossword puzzle. It was a completely different experience than the LACMA show where there are these kind of... Um, uh, you know, uh, light-controlled galleries. And so it went to various venues, and in every venue I changed it. And I changed it because it allowed me to continue a different kind of engagement with the work. And it challenged me in thinking of, thinking another iteration allowed me to think of the work differently. So when it finally came back here and we did it at the Mills College Art Museum, I was working with a, a young um, architectural team by the name of IOOA, Interim Office of Architecture. They're no longer together, but it was John Randolph, Bruce Tom, and, and Douglas Burnham. And we kind of, I said, you guys, I want you to help me with this. Um, I, here's some of my ideas. And one of the ideas we had was that we would interview the person who worked for Kelly Moore Paint, and that person's job for 26 years was to do nothing but, you know, name the paints. Like, if you've ever looked at the um, paint chips in a hardware store, a paint store, you know, it'll say something like Orchid's Wisp, or, you know, um, I mean, and I've often thought of those on kind of a literary level, and I thought, how do you come up with this stuff? So. We, um, we proposed to the gallery director at the time, I'd like to paint the gallery 26 different colors. Um, which I'm sure they have, loved that. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, absolutely not. Um, and then I further described that I wanted to reverse the gesture of the way we, we would normally look at artwork, that I would use excerpts from, um, from the essay, uh, and the essay was done by um, Bay Area writer um, Anne Lamont, who writes a lot about family. And because of the, the, what this book was about, or this project was Home and Other Stories, was about family. So I said, well, let's, let's change the way that we look at this. Let's, let's use the text and blow that up to these kind of architectural columns, and then um, very subjectively use those colors, those 26 new colors for, for um, home, it was like spring's new colors. And I would allow those um, photographs to kind of begin and end um, very subjectively, so there's nothing scientific about it. So you can get a sense here of, of what it looked like. Uh, and it made you stand back in order to read the, the um, excerpts from Anne Lamont's essay, and then you had to go forward in order to um, really read the photographs. And again, this is probably 20 years ago. I did a lot of things like kind of use the corners, played with the architecture, um, the, the way that paint kind of splits the triptych. So these are all like experiments for me um, to kind of think about the work differently and to think about how, like the strategy of presentation, how does it change the meaning of the work? And it, it should be said that um, while this kind of a presentation today for a, a show of photographs wouldn't be uh, so surprising in the, at this time in the 90s, the, um, this was not the way that, that photographers were presenting their work, you know, and, and so I think that you probably had some pushback or some, you know, sort of responses yeah. that were m maybe um, wondering what you were trying to do. <laughs> well, it was interesting, always the chief curator of the museum would, would say, oh my God, this is fantastic, go ahead, run with it, but oftentimes you know, depending on the institution, the photography curator would say, this is not how we look at photographs. Yeah. So there was a lot of pushback, and it was after kind of a, a conversation that everybody got on board and, and, and ultimately was very happy with, with the outcome. But it was kind of challenging and pushing some boundaries about the way we think about photography. Yeah, for sure. Um. Okay, um, and so so this is a, another example of um, your collaboration with uh, with 
architects and, and um, exhibition designers in order to figure out a way to present a body of work that, um, that um, sort of frames it and, and relates to the, the subject matter. Um, and here it was um, about science. Um, and so um, maybe I'll, I'll let you start and, and sort of describe what the project was and then I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions about it. So I, I had done a book many years before that called American Classroom and I got very in, interested in thinking about, I started photographing these children's science experiments and from those children's science experiments it made me very interested to think about how science is impacting the times in which we live. And at that time what was going on was the beginning of the Human Genome Project. Mm -hmm. And very naively I thought, I started re reading the New York Times and kind of learning about genetics and I was really struck with how um, how the research of, of, of genetic um, uh, research was really ch could impact the way in which we live. And so I, I thought, what would it be like to try to make initially still lifes within the, within the laboratories of the Human Genome Project? So very naively, I wrote a letter to the head of the Human Genome Project and said, um, what do you think about future ruins? No, and uh, <laughs> so I said, uh, that I was interested in, in kind of being embedded as an artist in the gallery, in the, in the um, laboratories of the Human Genome Project, and they were like, impossible. Um, and then we talked further and we wrote further and I had just gotten off a Guggenheim Fellowship and that was something the science world understood. So that there was some kind of like acknowledgement, like a scholarly acknowledgement. <laughs> so long story short, they said yes. And so for a period of four years, I. Uh, circulated between MIT, Los Alamos, Stanford, uh, Washington University, St. Louis, the seven sites of the Human Genome Project, um, and worked with you know Nobel scientists, sat on panels with them, and, and ended up having um, amazing conversations about uh, intentionality and impact and culture and um, what I what I left with after making these photographs and thinking about this was that um, that you know I think scientists and artists are, are, are actually climbing a, um, the same mountain albeit choosing different paths mm -hmm. so in this exhibition the one thing I thought about on in terms of a crit critical level was that science was always talking about the specificity of um, a very kind of almost what I thought was a very monocular vision of, of of how this would impact culture. So I thought, let's design the museum in St. Louis so that there would be these cubicles that would kind of metaphorically talk about that, the, the, my criticality of the ways I was thinking about science. And there's always, a, um, in those days, a, an, an analog light box there. So I decided I would work with the light box as a structure, an architectural structure, and again, um, appropriate the language of the writers that I was working with, which was like William Gass, who's an amazing writer, um, uh, Helen Longino, who's the um, endowed chair in philosophy of science at Stanford, um, and, the, and the curator from Germany, Cornelia Homburg. So this is how that exhibition came to be. And so, so the... the so some of the ideas you were trying to convey then would also be like about order, about sort of the construction of, uh, of science, like what science does in terms of like categorizing, because it, it has this very, you know, sort of um, rigid structure to it. Um, um, and then also the, the photographs are often in grids. Is, you know, is that a response then to this idea of taxonomy or it, it classification. Was. I think you hit it on like the, you know the idea of like categories and catalog cataloging and categories and I'm always thinking about the impact on culture in kind of a greater a, kind of a larger umbrella but I would be talking to scientists who would say I'm studying the left lower earlobe and how that earlobe might be in reference to and it was always a very very a very tight circle. Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking, I was asking questions that were very different. And so the main question about the genome was, you know, who gets to decide what represents a human standard or who gets to decide what is normal? 
And those were the kinds of things that I was really interested in. So I used those, those kind of provocative questions and I tried to make that part and parcel with the actual design of the exhibition. And so, uh, you know, in the, in the, the last series that we looked at, you, you said you wanted to have it be sort of a narrative and so the, that the triptychs or the, would become kind of a sentence or a, a sequence that, that, that helped you into the, the story. Um, and so do, you know, um, and, and then here, not in this example, but maybe in the, in the next one, um, you have a lot of grids. Um, yeah. Um, how do you make those decisions, you know, as you're going, you know, is that like, tell me a little bit about your process of the decision making in terms of like the um, making the photograph and then how you'll present it because, you know, you're taking the pictures individually, but sometimes you're choosing to show them as a, as a large grid right. or as a, as a triptych and, and that affects how people experience the, the right. pictures, if it's one or if it's a, a series. I think when I'm actually making the photographs and like this was one that I was making during that time, I'm tackling different areas that I'm, that I'm running up against and I'm, I'm very much kind of thinking, um, in that moment in C2. And there'll be times where I might think, that, like this one in particular, I was like, God, there were so many different jars and bottles with these pieces of salient language. And I thought, I need to do a, a gallery that had nothing, that, that was only about text, text and the still life. Or um, in this one, sequential molecules. Each one of those molecules is, um, talks about a different area of science and for anything from like material science, like how to build a, a safer airplane wing to the most recent research in, in um, uh, HIV pharmacology. So in making these molecule photographs, I knew that I wanted to work with a grid mm -hmm. and, I, and, there's, and sometimes repetition becomes very much a strategy of, of the way I'm thinking. So, so it's part of the process as you're shooting, as rather shooting. than you've made all these pictures and then you're trying to figure out how to put them together. Like when I when I make a typology, I already know in the process that's what I'm doing, or that's what I'm going to try to do. And so the the exhibition, you know, takes form, um, and I, it was designed here so that. Basically, when you walked in the museum, one hall, you look down at a typology of fossils, and you're looking at from where have we come, like, you know, where, where, where have we come? And then you look the other way, and you're looking at this 12-part 12 12 typology of, of these portraits of the interiors of genetic research. And the piece is called 12 Areas of Concern and Crisis. So you're looking at where are we going with all of these um, kind of genetic experiments. Well, and this is a, that's a good segue into, <laughs> yeah, into, yeah. into this project. And in the, in the interest of time, we should probably just keep moving forward. And, yeah. um, and so this, this project um, was a commercial project, but that, um, that came directly out of um, the previous one, which is um, pretty interesting. It's not something that you sought out, but that, that came to you. So I received a phone call. I mean, many of you are, might know Comme de Garçon, the very high fashion, and the, the, the artist behind Comme de Garçon is Rei Kawakubo, and she's always made these very challenging um, dresses and other articles of clothing that challenge the ways in which we think of the body. And I've, I've been a huge fan of hers for years, and she saw these photographs in London at a collector's house, and they were the frozen um, archives of genetic research. And she saw them and she said to her husband, because she doesn't speak English, she said, call Catherine Wagner and find out if she'll work with us to, to do an installation for the new Comme des Garçons store in, in Kyoto. So you can imagine I get this call and I'm like, are you sure she wants to use the freezers? But the more I think about her work, the more I realize, um, kind of we have a, the, the affinity she might have for those kinds of photographs. Well, there, again, it's about bodies. Um, right. It's a, you know, the, these Body, are samples yeah. that were taken from bodies that happen to be in freezers. They're disembodied, but, they, but it's about bodies. Mm -hmm. So in Kyoto, it's flanked by two 15th century historical Japanese buildings and then Comme de Garçons very, very 21st century black lacquer 
modernist building where they're always doing a, a tunnel and no signage out front. So we worked together one summer and we made those photographs 18 feet high, laminated them onto stainless steel, pliable stainless steel, and we created a skin for the, for the actual store. So um, this is walking through the tunnel. Now you're, you're, you're in the store and you're actually seeing like it's in this commercial environment, but everything you see around it are those um, 12 areas of concern and crisis uh, photographs. And you can't escape them. Um, and we were very subversive. We even made the dressing rooms when you want to go try something on. You had to look at yourself in the mirror amidst those freezers so that you were always having to engage in that kind of cultural... Um, so this is actually one of the dressing rooms. So we're a little short on time, so I think we should probably move, move on, yeah. Move forward a little. Yeah. Just I'm thinking maybe we we um just touch on this really quickly because I, I I'm really interested in talking about the, the next one because I think it's really okay. interesting how you brought some some of the themes together. So maybe just quickly. So this was um um something actually that's very topical because it's called Pomegranate Wall, and the I think the 75th anniversary is it the 75th 75th 50th. There's a curator from the San Jose Museum of Art here, so they're doing a, a series of five. Uh, women's sh shows, Jay DeFeo, Pay White, myself, and two other artists. And I did this piece um, when I had received a grant, uh, um, had had a grant to work with technology, and it's called Pomegranate Wall. And I worked with the MRI um, to um, kind of like look through matter. And I won't talk about it much because it's going to reopen in April this year. So come and hear about it then. <laughs> Uh, it's going to reopen at the San Jose Museum of Art. Um, so this is a piece, this is the piece that, so this was a piece um, that I was asked to work on in downtown Los Angeles right next to the LA Times and it was a very political hotbed of a, of a landscape because many people bought these very expensive condominiums to move downtown in Los Angeles and they were promised this public park in front of them. And the LAPD took that site over, but made, made a um, um, concession that there would still be a public park. So they asked a few artists to participate in that. And I did this piece called Ghost Grove because uh, it was, it was a, um, at the turn of the century, from Pasadena all the way down to Los Angeles was nothing but beautiful, verdant um, uh, citrus groves. So I kind of tried in this, in this photographic project which became, so that's a, a ghost grove where everywhere you see orange, those are um, these laser etched aluminum panels of, um, of existing gro ghost groves in Ojai, which used to go all the way down through LA. So it was, again, it starts with the photograph. It was to bring, um, to bring this kind of like park-like setting um, and, and kind of a mnemonic, historical mnemonic place to it. And it, it has an interesting echo, I think, with Moscone because it's, it's about what used to be there. Exactly. Um, and you're, you know, so you have this um, very beautiful kind of echo of the, of the past through these photographs that are then, you know, transposed onto this, you know, material that isn't really a photographic material. So you're, you're, it's a sort of reminder of a past that, you know, nobody who's, who's around today would have known, no, no. Um, but that that's, you know, the, the history of Los Angeles is, is in there. And, and you're doing that through, as you said, this, this this beauty, and I, I, I just, I think this is a really incredible, very successful project because I, you were also talking about how it was a, a very political um, site, and so what you chose was something that that was not about the the, the issues. Um, but it welcomed it was, everybody it, in. It welcomed, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a very low tech thing here. I use these orange mylar, archival orange mylar circles to kind of metaphorically talk about falling oranges, and so depending on what time of day and what year it is, the sunlight hits those oranges and they project onto the side of the wall. So as you're kind of walking through the auditorium, you're seeing these oranges um, kind of 
falling, falling oranges. Well, and it's, it's just so, when you're talking about a, an expanded photographic practice, which is what this is all about, you know, this, the origins of this is, an, is a photographic idea, but most people who come and see this are, are not necessarily going to think that, you right. know. Um, so, I mean, for me, though, it always starts with an image. Yeah. So it always starts with a photographic image. Um, and we'll move through this one quickly. This was something in um, Los Angeles, or it is in Los Angeles, it's called Wave Echo. I was asked to work on a project for a, a new, near the Civic Center in, La, in Santa Monica. And I interviewed a lot of people at these community meetings to say, why do you live in Santa Monica? And everybody said, proximity to the ocean. But they were building this, a really good architect was building this um, uh, facility that was going to be retail, luxury housing, artist studios, and they wanted some, something grounded in, with the artwork, but very few people would have access to the ocean. So I thought I would bring the ocean to them. And I made these photographs of, of the, the bay out in Santa Monica, and many of them, and then worked with somebody, um, a coder, um, to write code to transfer all of those um, photographs to, um, to to an LED 36-foot ellipse. And we tapped into the buoys out in Santa Monica Bay. And you, anyone can do this because it's open source. And we tapped into these buoys that feed back to the computer there. And it gives you a, a real-time readout of what's happening atmospherically in the ocean at that time. And then I put a nine-foot video camera in the top of that ellipse so that when you're walking under it, you're now part of that ocean experience. So you're seeing as people are gathering there, those white, those white um, illuminations there are basically tracking what's going on underneath the ellipse. So the piece is called Wave Echo, and when nobody's underneath it, you're just getting a readout of, of actually what's happening in real time in the bay. So it's really a participatory piece, you know, did you anticipate the way that people would interact with it or has that surprised you how they, how well, they ended up interacting? I mean, I, I designed it so that, you know, the, the video camera was, is a heat sensor camera so that I always knew that I wanted, I wanted people to be able to record themselves mm -hmm. in, this, in the ocean landscape. Yeah. What I didn't know is that I got a call like a year after it was being done and they're like, so this piece is very popular with the people who are living in the park across the street and they come pretty loaded at night and do snow angels underneath it. <laughs> um, so now they have to turn it off at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> so it's very successful. <laughs> but you can just see, so if there's a lone person walking through, you'll see that. So it's been, it's, it is a very interactive piece and I thought that was actually very poetic in terms yeah. of kind of bringing allowing everybody to have access to the ocean. And so we'll end with, with this um, uh, exhibition, which um, unfortunately just closed very recently at Mills. And um, you used for the title Archaeology in Reverse, which is a, um, which is a term that you mentioned um, in the beginning was something that you coined when talking about Moscone. Um, and so I, I'm wondering, do you see a connection between these two projects? And maybe you can talk about what, what that idea of archaeology in reverse means to you and how you sort of, how it manifested in this project. I think when I first saw the Moscone project, I, I thought very much about, you know, it was this place of excavation, but it was revealing things about the future. And that was something that I found really potent. So this is up in the, up in the attic of, of the Mills College Art Museum, and nobody can go up there because of OSHA laws, etc. But when I went up there many years ago, I had that same sense of awe, that same sense of awe at looking at this kind of um, maybe almost archaic engineering, but that there's something so right about the structure of it and the ways in which it's, it's, it's been made. But I knew nobody would be able to see it. So I asked the director, could I make an installation up there and then devise ways of, of, of allowing people to see it through different kinds of practices. And, and originally I had proposed a, a periscope for the um, Santa Monica thing, that everybody would have periscopes outside, and that didn't fly. So I, you know, I recycled these ideas and, and thought, well, the periscope would be perfect for here. So this is actually an installation that was made in the attic of the museum, but I know that nobody could see it. Um, so 
it exists as a photograph, and I'm actually quite pleased with the photograph. I mean, if you've never seen this at all, the photograph for me is actually, I think, kind of in a more finite way, the way it, it best reads. So moving back to making the photograph, in this way I, I reverse the gesture because I make an installation, but then I ultimately make the photograph, which is, I've decided, the way that it's best seen. So. Um, I just was making these interventions every time an exhibition went down, I would go in and I would kind of alter something in there that um, ultimately would, would read as a photograph. So it's kind of reversing that now that they, they become photographs. But it was a mix of, um, of making photographs of the installation that was up, you know, up in the attic, um, as well as kind of, I, I opened up the entire museum all the areas that had been closed off for like 30, 40, and 50 years. And there was this kind of, again, that kind of excavation. And something like this door that had been shut for years and, and, and people had done these various kinds of interventions to install something. And there was just like kind of the layers of information that I found like fascinating. So this, this gives you a sense of how, um, how it reads. The blue piece at the top is, is basically a digital map, a topographic map of exactly where the museum is located. And um, just using the sunlight from, from the top um, to project down in, at a certain time of day that that map would actually read on the museum floor. So the, the museum itself is the is the subject of the of the show. Right. It's the container for the show, and then it's also the subject of right. the show. Right. Um, um, and there was just other devices. I worked again with a great architectural team named um, Nicholas de Monchot and Kate Mole, and they were my next door neighbors neighbors when I lived in Rome at the American Academy in Rome, and we'd always wanted to work together on something. And I said, I really thought that periscopes were the way to be able to see the installation above. So um, it's designed so that these are a, a series of periscopes that you have to find the right, right place in order to, to, to witness the installation above. You look down at the mirror that's on the floor, and the mirror is reflecting what you're seeing up on the, uh, up on the ceiling where you can't go. So yeah. that, that actually is one of the... Um, that's how you actually see a fragment. And it's, it's, I'm, there I'm kind of like really allowing myself to work with abstraction in the greatest sense, which is something that ultimately, I, I chose the medium of photography, which is so seemingly representational, and yet I'd say the majority of my, um, my um, inspiration comes from abstraction. Um, and I think I'll, have, I'll ask you one more question, then we'll open it up for a minute if there are any other questions. but. Um, just with this notion of, of you know, a, a practice that has expanded beyond um, photography, which is what we, we've talked about, are there places that you're looking to go now that you're thinking that you haven't, things that you haven't done yet? You've, you finally have your periscopes, and so yeah. that's something that you want to do. Are there other, other kinds of things that you're looking at now that you would ultimately like to incorporate into, into a project in the future? Well, I've, I've actually just been, for several years, been thinking about I've been making these um, wood end grain photographs about the end grain of wood, but they are now becoming both photographs and then there's another component where I'm taking kind of domestic furniture and pieces of architecture and making interventions into those. So it's the photographs with the sculpture that will become the new body of work. So. Looking forward to seeing it. <laughs> um, well, uh, we have a couple minutes. If, if does anybody have any questions that they might want to ask? Anybody? Okay. Um, do you have any last parting words you'd like to say? Okay. <laughs> I think you'll be able to ride the subway in about 17 years. <laughs> so I, I can't wait for you to because I'm really very excited about the granite. So. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, Erin. And thank you all for coming.